So, ladies and gentlemen, I, I've just told all the stories. So I know. So we're done. <laughs> we're we... done. Okay. So here we go. Here's Jonathan. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm really happy that Jonathan is the first guest on um, on this series. Uh, I talked a little bit about what it's about. It's IG Live Conversations, celebrating 30 years of Giant Step. Uh, and I'm going to be speaking to people who've been a part of the company journey in some way, but are also thought leaders in their own industry. And uh, Jonathan obviously is part of the journey, but also is a thought leader in his own industry too. So, um, what stories did I miss? I was trying to hold on, but it was just troubleshooting. Um, I, don't know I, I told the story of how we met, but you're welcome to. It'd be interesting to see if it, if if they're the same. <laughs> That's um, what I was thinking. Do they yeah. match? But um, I think, you know, one of the things that I, I think is very, very important, because this is really me talking to you, not you, you talking to me, is, is hearing about people's early lives and, and childhood, because I think that's what really shapes people to what they are and what they become. And you, Jonathan, have a very unique story in the fact that you grew up in apartheid South Africa. And people need to understand that, you know, music, there, there, there was there, a lot of music was banned from South Africa. So you weren't able to get the cultural stream that we were getting in uh, the United States or getting in, um, in, in Europe. Um, so tell us a little bit about your, your sort of like upbringing and, and, and how you were discovering music back then. Hang on one second. Let me let me get let me get our puppets to stop barking, and then and then I'm right back. In case of not enough issues. Um, that's a really interesting question, Morris. I'm glad you brought you broached it that way. So, my I I was really fortunate in many ways. A, being white in South Africa, obviously during apartheid, is, you know, it, it's just something that you you don't have you don't have to deal with everything else. As a white person in South Africa and a white person, even an American, that's a whole nother conversation. But growing up in South Africa, I was fortunate enough to, to meet a, a record store owner when I was around 13 years old. I was already a huge music fan. And there's a neighborhood in Johannesburg called Hillbrow. And Hillbrow was, to me, was always like the Bronx or like New York, is at least what I understood as an early teen of what America and New York was like. And mm -hmm. Hillbrow was like, anything goes, and politics was, you know, everything went out the window. It was a hub, it was a late night city. And this guy, Leonard Barold, owned a record store called the Hillbrow Record Library, something like that. And it was a record library, and you would go in, and you would rent records, and right. you weren't supposed to tape them, but you would tape them. Yeah. So what is incredible about this guy is he had James Brown, he had Fela, he had Abdullah Ibrahim, he had John Coltrane, he had classical records, he had Ladysmith Black Mambazo. And I pretty much got an insane musical education from this man. And sort of what followed on from that is sort of kind of like my whole musical route and career in a way, because it showed music being the sort of connector with people. It took away from politics where it could. It showed me that in the middle of apartheid, this is how people connected. The American jazz scene was enormous in America, not from the live perspective, but from what people understood, John Coltrane and Dizzy and Pharaoh and Bird and everybody that they've gotten the records of. They completely understood what the music was and the music was like a liberation outside of Phelan, James Brown and of more obvious liberation music, jazz was a liberator. Mm -hmm. So I got, I got a really young introduction to music. And on top of that, Hillbrow, like I said, was kind of a melting pot of people from everywhere and politics seemed to have gone out the window. And then on top of that, the only live music show I remember of an American artist was Percy Sledge. I don't fully understand why Percy Sledge came to South Africa. I think he had a big hit. Maybe mm -hmm. politics didn't mean that much to him. Yeah, to break, yeah. yeah, maybe he managed to break the boycott. I don't fully understand mm -hmm. to this day. But nevertheless, our, my introduction to Bob Marley and a lot of people seeing them live was through film. You know, 
internet was a whole nother thing in those days. Right. And well, it didn't exist, yeah. Yeah, and we, we, were, we were dancing to Bob Marley films and Fela and James Brown in a, in a theater called the, the Market Theater in Johannesburg. And that was another political hub where you could watch Ethel Fugard plays and all that kind of stuff. So to cut a long story short, that was my introduction to music while getting with local music like Dollar Brand, Abdullah Ibrahim, mm-hmm. Huma Sakela, Miri Makiba, um, Ladysmith, Black Mambaza with kind of the unbelievable music and sort of a way to communicate with everybody since there were so many dialects and languages as well. So jump ahead with all of that, managing to sort of take a trip to America sort of as a youth still to sort of try and understand what my, what I could do with my musical taste and what I could do with music. I managed to take a, a trip to America and see what it was all about. And the way that the journey actually happened was my family and cousins and us, we owned a Middle Eastern restaurant. We owned a steakhouse in Johannesburg and I was the chef. And it turned out that we somehow got connected to the landlord in LA in Century City who had a property. And, you know, they were like, hey, come and open up one of your places in in LA. I was like, all right, LA seems great, whatever, amazing. In the 80s, early 80s, and it was like, convinced everybody, hey, let's go, let's go do this. Land in LA in what's now called the Westfield Shopping Center. So it's mm-hmm. a big shopping center Very that's got a vibe. Yeah. What they promised for the restaurant was like, hey, here's a place to open up this restaurant, it's gonna be a huge hit and whatever. So needless to say, none of that happened, but the restaurant opened. Um, for some reason, the village people ended up doing a show at the restaurant. I have no idea why or how. We ended up renting out the restaurant to promoters on the weekend to just sort of do parties with like Prince and Soul and Funk and special guests and whatnot. Mm. And right across the street from where I was cooking and being a chef was Columbia Records. Mm-hmm. So Black Rock was right over there and Polly Anthony and Glenn Brunman and a lot of like the heads of different people from Colombia used to come into the restaurant and sort of hang out. And on top of that, people like Joe Sample from the Crusaders lived in LA. He used to come in and hang out at the bar and be a guest. So it was sort of like, even though it was in food and not music at that point, it was kind of like the amazing introduction to the music scene. And also around that time, the music scene was the Roxy and the Whiskey and Punk and all of stuff like Echo and the Bunny Man and Joy Division, a lot of this stuff coming over you know, to LA and, you know, James White and the Blacks and whoever else, there was this crazy melting pot of music going on in LA. So, you know, just needing to find a place out of South Africa where I felt like absolutely trapped and and not really being able to be effective. And what year did you move to New York? 1983. So 1980, and tell us, I mean, because that's, four years or five years before I moved. So right. tell us a little bit about what New York was like back then, where, where you were hanging out, what clubs, what, what venues, just paint the picture a little bit. Well, one, one just had a quick bridge to make. So, so by the time I was leaving LA and very happy to leave LA, it was like New York is why I came to America in the first place. And I didn't really know what I was gonna do there, but I had starting work, I'd started working with sort of global music and African music sort of in LA already, and I was promoting this group from Zimbabwe called the Bundu Boys. Sorry, mm-hmm. I'm speaking so fast because I don't want to run out of time with this. Um, and when I went over to New York, I kind of had a PR and marketing background a little bit by working with an African and global music. Mm-hmm. So arriving in New York, I mean, 83 in New York, which a lot of kind of our giant step fans and friends and followers can attest to, 83, 84, absolute crazy days in New York, time of Basquiat and Keith Haring and Grace Jones and Dan Soteria. And I mean, an unbelievable period in New York for music and Save the Robots and just kind of an unbelievable mixture of James White and the Blacks playing stronky jazz with the Lounge Lizards, with Nick Cave and the Birthday Party and hip hop and Africa Mavada and whatever else. So again, it was another incredible introduction to lower Manhattan East Village where kind of was chaos. It was mayhem. It was New York with Bank Sorry, Florida. Jonathan. Yeah. So I wanted to, are people hearing an echo? Um, Cause I, a couple of people are saying they're hearing an echo on. Is that better? Is that better? Does that work? Um, yeah, only, only one person said it, so hopefully it's, yeah. Sorry, sorry for interrupting. 
No, that's okay. Um, yeah. So, oh, wait. yes, they are hearing an echo. So, Let, uh, let's see if that works better without the headphones. Still? Still an echo, guys? Maybe I, mean, I should. Maybe I should use headphones. As a, <laughs> okay. <laughs> we got all people giving the technical. Limit. Here we go. I'm you now using headphones. So. Is that better, guys? What do we think? Okay, a little bit, oh. but it's not bad. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Jonathan. All right. Well, hopefully okay. that's better. Anyway, yeah. I have to say that just again, New York in in those days was just like anything goes, you know, just the East Village was like bombed out zone. You know, just just I think the excitement of everybody being poor, nobody having money, the kind of excitement of a kind of brand new, brave new world of like you can do anything. Street art was incredible, you know, just community was amazing. And I think just being in the East Village there was like the biggest um, playground and the biggest education one person, anybody could have. And right. never had to go above 14th Street at all, you know, which right. kind of stayed with us in a way on sort of giant step early years is we pretty much did so much stuff downtown. Yeah. You know, except, so. Except for the um, supper club. Yeah, except for the supper club. Exactly. <laughs> is that, um, I, I, yeah, yeah, I don't know if that gives enough on sort of yeah, my personal at, background on New York. At, at, absolutely. And then what year did you start working at SOBs? So SOBs was probably, I don't know exactly, but let's say 84, 85. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing about SOBs, another just anecdote, I guess, was before, I think I just realized how I might have found SOBs. So I was working in a food shop in the East Village in a little gourmet food shop at the time. And um, my, my first foray, I guess, into the business was I met a young French artist called Madère. He was a chef in the kitchen. And if you look up M-A-D-E-R, he's a, music, a film composer. He's composed a bunch of really good films and he has a really good track record. He had a, a sort of chanson, a, a French influenced album, which was very East Village at the time. And he was like, oh, I could really use some help in getting this out, whatever. I love the music. I thought it was just really a twist on classic French music. And I sort of used whatever money I had and I formed a record label called Tango Records and put out his album with him. You know, needless to say, it kind of was way before its time or maybe should never have come out. I had no idea. I loved it. Mm -hmm. I thought it was quirky and would totally fit in the dance here in that world. And this is the time where the Smiths were just breaking out. So you can imagine why the record probably didn't work. Right. So we had advice from uh, Peter, who was sort of handling Mute at the time, Peter Wright in New York. And he was handling Mute and the Smiths and stuff. And I was like, oh, this early cabaret style French record could be quirky enough to meet a punk audience. So shortly after that, I think I got introduced to SOBs and I explained to them I was working in global music and stuff like that and doing PR and marketing. And they were like, oh, why do you work with this group called Cassav from Martinique, who were huge mm -hmm. in France and in Martinique. And, mm -hmm. you know, even Miles, for example, was a, Miles Davis was a huge fan of Cassav. Mm -hmm. And I started with them and they were like, oh, let's see how it goes. I ended up getting New York Times and I ended up, you know, just luckily because they were so huge, um, ended up just doing a great job with them, getting them mm -hmm. every piece of publicity. And Larry Gold, the owner of SOBs, was like, hey, you're in. Why don't you kind of stay with us? And that sort of started my tenure fully in music and being at a club like SOBs, which, my goodness, just was our early years and just gave us the, the, yeah. the support and a place to be based out of and not only do shows at SOBs, but do stuff at the Palladium and the Ritz and so many other things, you know. And I ended up doing shows with Fela and with, you know, uh, the list is endless. I mean, mm -hmm. just the who's who of global funk, soul, mm -hmm. jazz, you know, mm -hmm. even even before starting Groove Academy and mm -hmm. Giant Step with you, Morris. Mm -hmm. So um, I briefly told the story of how we met. Um, I think it'd be good to get, get your take on it. See if it, um, and then then I want to get into the club and then get on to other, some other stuff. So, sure. um, yeah. Well, let me give a quick version of that. So um, okay. through the SOB stuff and what we were doing, and doing shows at other clubs and like I said, Palladium and the Ritz and wherever else with, with Larry, I was like, let's do a global divas show. 
you know, I was well into world music, obviously, and was like, let's do divas from all over the world, from Brazil and here, then India and whatnot, and ended up doing kind of only one artist, which was Najma Akhtar, who I believe is married to Robert Plant, I could be mistaken, but... Oh, she, she was going out with him at the time. Okay, anyway, not a play to fame. She was a great artist on... Awesome, world, yeah. ...on World Circuit, I believe, mm -hmm. and there was a whole world music buzz going on, and ended up at Town Hall, sort of just looking into the way that it could work. And you were there. And, you know, you seem to be running the place. You know, I'm not sure. I think you were an intern. But I was the intern, yeah. You yeah. seemed to be the only person who had an idea of what was going on and you were keen and mm. enthusiastic. Mm. And the, the most fun part was just starting to jam with you on like, hey, what else is there? We spoke about Giles and we spoke mm -hmm. about, you know, why is there not a jazz scene here? And why is there not a jazz dance scene? And is the Blue Note, club no disrespect to the blue note but is that it mm -hmm. you know right. as the young scene and we started speaking and you'd mentioned sort of leon thomas and you're friendly with you'd somehow come across peewee and maceo and fred wesley and the jbs and nobody was working because james brown was in jail and leon thomas seemed like the wild card to the connection to that but you were like hey i met them and you know can whatever we just started talking and when I said it was based at sobs and you followed up on it and you know we the very first show we did together was that incredible amalgam of, of artists, you know, mm -hmm. so five different names of groups for that particular show. So yeah. that's what I remember anyway. I, I, I think pretty <laughs> spot on, uh, pretty yeah. spot on. Awesome. So um, l let's get into the club quickly because uh, we, we don't have a huge amount of time. Um, you know, it started in 1990. You, you were with the company until 2001. What, I mean, what are some of the highlights for you? Just some, just some great moments or memories that you have that you want to share, uh, whether it's DJ sets, just moments, records, uh, whatever. Just go for it. Oh, man, there's so many moments. I think just starting out from the name, you know, you came up with Groove Academy and then we were looking for a name or what were you going to call the next version you know and we were walking along Halston Street as I remember it and we were just jamming on classic album names and we were that's why I've got JC in the background you know obviously a huge favorite but we were jamming on names and it just sort of turned out yay John Coltrane giant steps and was like well we obviously can't use giant steps but a it's a giant step and b we were stepping we were literally walking along Halston Street I don't even know where mm -hmm. we we're going but mm -hmm. we were stepping so giant step just stuck as a name and that's a is always going to be a fond memory, you know, obviously throughout highlights. I mean, just the, the, the biggest highlight for me is that we just went for it. We're such music fans and we were like every, every time something just got better, we started the club night and it caught on eventually and started working. And then we were calling up, you know, like, like you were calling up Bootsy at home, wondering if we'd even get the real Bootsy to come out and do a show. And then he did. And then just sticking with Bootsy, I remember, I think we were presenting Bootsy at Tramps and we weren't sure there was, the fake Bootsy was coming into town. We weren't even sure if we got the real Bootsy and I was backstage with Bootsy to welcome him. And he, this Bootsy opened up his bass case, the star bass, and he looked at his bass like he'd never seen it in his life. And I was like, oh, we're in trouble. We're really in trouble here. And then he picked up the bass eventually and he played and I was like, yeah, we're, we're saved. This is Bootsy. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there was stuff like that. And then another just quirky moment. Our first anniversary show was George Clinton and at the Palladium. And Blowfly, you know, was like, hey, let's put on Blowfly. That might have been your idea. And we'd, al we'd already done a show with him at oh, okay. SOBs. Yeah, so we brought so, him back. Yeah. Right, so the brilliant yeah. idea was to have the brand new heavies who were also on the bill <laughs> be the backing back band. Back yeah. Blowfly. And I don't think they fully researched or understood what it was. So they did. They missed the sound check because their flight was late. So they came in and they were just like, oh, these are the grooves behind these particular tracks. And of course, right. Blowfly was triple X rated versions of funk classics. They get on stage with them. They start doing the jams and Blowfly starts doing his X rated stuff. And they suddenly realize what they got themselves into. Don't think they finished the song and they walked off stage. So yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he went one, two, one, two, three, four. And there was no band. And the band had bolted, but <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. no disrespect to the brand new heavies because, you know, what, I might have done the same thing. Anyway, just keeping in the funk vein, I think we, we were presenting War at Wetlands one night and the Ohio players at uh, SOBs. And I think it was on 11-11 on my birthday on top of everything. And 
Um, I went from, I, I think you were around, but I don't remember why I was running back and forth to the venues, but I was saying a prayer with the Ohio players in the dressing room downstairs because they were pretty religious. And they were like, let's say a prayer, got them on stage and then rushed down to War, who were like one of my childhood, absolute favorite bands of all times and went to introduce War on stage at, you know, at Wetlands. So that was a thrill. And then the fifth year anniversary, having Ohio players in Bryant Park, we somehow convinced them to do an anniversary event with us. I think we had 10,000 people there. It was and ridiculous, yeah. I don't think Brian Park has done another event musically since then, except maybe fashion events. No, they, so, they still, they've done some music events, but I don't think as many people as that. So, yeah. 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 So that, and then stuff like Red Hot and Cool at the Supper Club, you know, which is a phenomenal night. sort of event. And New Rick and Soul with Unbelievable Toyers and George Benson and Louis and... India and whoever else at the supper club and, you know, sticking with supper club, uh, Anthony Baudin, rest in peace, was the chef at the supper club in the heyday of when we mm -hmm. were doing those, yeah. those incredible nights when we had the good fortune of doing stuff at the supper club. And Anthony would come and after, you know, doing the kitchen stuff, would come and hang out at the club, you yeah. know. And he so, wrote about it in Kitchen he wrote Confidential. About, yeah, he wrote when, it's, when it, yeah. Yeah. When uh, I saw salt, that in the book, I was like, that's phenomenal. So we, met, we mentioned Soul Kitchen. Yeah. Giant Step and another party, which wasn't ours, called Chicks with Dex. Chicks or with Chicks with Dicks. Chicks with, it was, it's, it's, I think, and Cafe Con Leche was there as well. Exactly. Um, uh, so, yeah, um, awesome. So I mean, there's um, stuff, uh, just, just a couple other yeah, quick ahead. things. Ahead. It, was, yeah. it was also like just the idea that, again, every time, it, it, it was just so mind-blowing for me, still is to this day, that, as we opened up another door to kind of like the jazz scene didn't fully exist except for the classic jazz scene. And every time we had good fortune of like bringing over a Jamiroquai or a Massive Attack or that was another highlight. Massive Attack's Blue Lines was huge, was such a groundbreaking record. And when they came over, you know, for a Halloween show and whatever we ended up doing with them, you know, it was one, you know, one Daddy G, you know, handing 3D at 45 and, then giving Horace Andy the mic, and it, it was so not blue lines. It was, it was, it was, it was a sound system. It was a sound was a system, system, which yeah, yeah. in of itself was remarkable, but it was like, wow, yeah. blue lines is just huge and such a groundbreaker. And we were still making stuff up at that point, too, jumping ahead and, you know, drinking wine with Tommy Lapuma, you know, was a huge rest in peace as well. It was a huge wine aficionado, you know, when we had meetings with Tommy, and we'd sit there and we'd be like, wow, this is Tommy Lapuma. And, you know, he's like going through his wine cellar or, you know, hipping us to like an incredible wine, you know, yeah, or going yeah. to have a meeting at the lot at, you know, A&M, you know, I'm not sure if we met Herb that day, because I know you've met Herb Alfred since, but I don't know who we were meeting with. But again, it's just like, hey, the gate opens and you're on the lot, you know. So, I mean, there's just hundreds of moments to just meeting heroes, a George Benson, a George Clinton, a... You know, to this day, I mean, sometimes I prefer not to meet an artist that I love because you just never know how it's going to go. And I mm -hmm. don't want to give examples of artists I've met who did not enjoy the experience. But um, I'm going to say that stuff like that has all been amazing. Do, 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 do you have a favorite Giant Step song from the club? Like, is there like one or two songs that like, uh, you know, those that that's, you know, I, just brings you right back? Um, Look, hot, Pal Joey's hot music is always going to do that because mm -hmm. to this day, it's as good now as it was and sort of respect to Pal Joey and just how it came about and that being, you know, um, obviously any, any of the deep spiritual jazz stuff that, you know, just the chances Smash and Jazzy and Nicodemus took on playing Coltrane or Pharaoh or deep spiritual jazz on the dance floor. Um, when Giant Step Records remixes and stuff were coming out, there was a, you know, a bunch of incredible stuff. Some stuff Richie and Genji did, uh, Richard and Genji did, um, Groove Collective. I mean, not songs per se, but just the energy around a Groove Collective. And just, again, that was like jazz for sort of a jam band or just like music fans who didn't know what hit them. Right. Um, to call Hancock Rux's remixes on the dance floor at the Shine Days. Mm -hmm. you know yeah. so and then dream warriors you know and diggable planets really just mm -hmm. change things in so many ways as well i'm probably leaving out so many obvious oh, classics I mean, yeah there's, there's hundreds um, but those are some good ones 
Um, uh, anything else you want to say about Giant Step? Because I want to um, spend the last 10 minutes uh, talking about sort of like, you know, uh, other stuff as well. So Yeah, for sure. Just, just two things. I want to um, just whoever's tuned in now. I mean, I just want to thank everybody who supported and just, you know, just loved it as much as we did and loved the vision. And thanks to all the DJs and the dancers and all the performers and everybody came down you know, who just believed in it as much as young Richard Worth believed in it, who pulled his flute out at SOBs. And thankfully, he only pulled his flute out, you know, and, and kind of started, you know, this, this journey. Um, and apologies to the Red Hot Chili Peppers for not letting them into Metropolis Cafe one night. When we were rammed, we just, you know, we had a huge audience out there and they arrived and not that I wasn't a fan or anything, but it just seemed... Yeah seemed weird to let in, you know, just a whole white group when you had so many people yeah. trying to get in the club. So mm -hmm. anyway, if I ever meet Flea face to face, I'll apologize to him and Kitas directly. Um, so yeah, just thanks for the support. I mean, yeah. it, it helps fuel so much and there's comparable scenes today. They may or may not have been influenced by Giant Step, but just incredible, you know, just how it all went. So um, at the end of 2001, um, I mean, 2001 was a crazy year in New York, uh, which culminated. It was a great year. And then September 11th, just it just all went to shit. And really after that, it was like New York had really been you know, kicked in kicked in the nuts. I mean, yeah. it was it, it was bad. And, you know, our office was below Canal Street. I know there's a lot of the old crew who are on here. They all remember that. And, you know, we, we got the club back up and going and we did events, but it, it really wasn't the same. And at the end of the year, you, you decided to leave and you've been living in New York for many, many years at that point. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about, you know, some of the stuff you've been doing over the last like 19 years, because you've been living in a lot of different places around the world, working on a lot of different great projects. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, let me, do, let me do a quick one on that. I mean, I, I was the number one New York fan, a Brooklyn fan, and, and just New York in general. And I never thought I would see the day of, you know, I just felt so at home and I was so in love with New York. And I always said to myself, if it didn't feel like home anymore, I just had to think about what to do. So, you know, we had, we had done already so much with Giant Step and Groove Academy and everything that was being done in 12 years. I think I was just exhausted. And, you know, um, I started getting into yoga and just sort of taking better care of myself. And 9-11 happened and India just popped in my head through my yoga and community. And it just India called in a way. And I just I was starting to make mistakes, you know, just small technical mistakes and stuff in in production. And I was just like, I need a break. And I just decided I need a, you know, um, for good or for bad, I just need a full break. And so I really honestly thought I would go to India and I'd offer myself up a service and maybe arrogantly, because maybe that's why I came back. But I really felt I'd go to India and I, that would be it. That would be my life and I'd see where it went. And I went there with that attitude. So I sold my record collection. I just, I just closed shop in a way. I was like, all right, sad to go, but wow. So I went to India and I lived there for six months. And thankfully I came back a day to the point where my green card would have run out. So that's probably the reason I got called back. And I came back to New York and I was like, oh, I don't, don't think I can live here again. Went to live in Mexico and I was like, all right, this is cool in Oaxaca, but no thanks. And then somehow got called to Amsterdam. So I moved to Amsterdam and that was a milestone in a way because I got to sort of live and work in Amsterdam and my job with K-Swiss as the brand and marketing director at the time took me to London and I had brand money and I managed to put support money towards Brownswood and towards Giles and towards Benji B's deviation and sound crash and it was like the dream weekends in London and running a, a sort of you know culture for a brand in Amsterdam and just being in Europe and putting money towards you know um, Daniel Best stuff in Berlin and just getting introduced to Little Dragon and, you know, um, Jose James and Soul and Pimp Sessions, whatever. Anyway, so that was, that was a good run of five years in Amsterdam and London. And, you know, case was, as brands tend to do, decided to close their culture down. And I was like, this is insane. But anyway, yeah, yeah. the good no news more culture. is yeah. no more culture. That's <laughs> not working, whatever. Just yeah. closed it down. All the people I know and knew there have moved on. So not disrespecting them. 
And they were like, oh, our headquarters are in LA. So if you want to continue what you're doing, you know, which I was thrilled with, come to LA. And it was the middle of a shitty winter in, in Amsterdam. So I moved to LA. And the great news about LA is that I met my wife, Nicole. You know, I've been working with Breakbeat Era and Ronnie Sides and stuff. And we're happily married. And we've got a beautiful little two-year-old boy. And so I have to say that them getting me back to LA you know, where LA suddenly had a culture and I could also, the blessing was Nicole and now having a baby, but I, I could, there's a culture as well in LA and I recognized that and sort of got me into the LA scene, working with people like Dexter Story and working with, you know, Kamasi and with Mark to Clive Lowe and Miguel Atwood Ferguson and LA's rich culture and being able to sort of then produce and curate a tribute to Gil Scott Heron and to Nina Simone and to the civil rights movement through all of these incredible musicians in LA um, and just, um, you know, continuing with Giles as an inspiration was working with Brownswood and then was the director of Worldwide FM in LA for two years, you know, and we did live music shows with Sudan Archives and with Miguel and with Dexter and Ethio Cali and Kamasi and the list is kind of endless, you know, so an incredible period in LA and then doing stuff with Sonos and so George and inviting Giles over and working with Eric Tucker and Jeremy Saul from KCOW on the lift and kind of inviting Crude and Dorfmeister and all the DJs and Moody Man and again Giles and just staying active within the culture of the scene. It always throughout everything I've done, sort of looking back to the legacy and the legends of stuff to be able to move forward. So after mm -hmm. a period in LA, it was like, all right, for whatever reason, you know, we we were blessed with Little Rye and decided to, lots of family in Portland, Oregon, and just ended up moving to Portland. So again, Portland turns out to be an incredibly progressive place. I'm working with the Sold Out Festival and Sold Out Productions, who is very much like a giant step in a way where there's been a festival for 11 years of the who's who of the scene. And now I'm working with PDX Jazz Festival, you know, which is a very much 19 year strong festival that's had everybody young the young lions the who's who in the jazz scene and then a very exciting project coming up which i can't talk about yet but hopefully i'll have the chance to talk about it soon you know something to do with the way we're all going to absorb music in kind of this period where we don't get to have live music you know again right. and at the same time consulting with incredible musicians like tomaso capolato you know, which again, it's been an incredible experience just to work with an Italian based artist who was based in LA, who just is so creative and inspirational. Working with another artist in Portland called Max Ribner, who, you know, again, is a, just working with such a great talent pool over here, you know, and still being able to work with people like Mark the Clive Lowe and yourself and just, you know, so again, just over all of these years with not being with Giant Step, sort of have kept in the legacy and the culture and dare I say experience of how music meets brands meets culture you know mm -hmm. and all of those early years of stuff that we did together just it's and a very grateful duplication of being able to expose legacy music and new music to young and old audiences alike right you know and incorporating yeah. food film music and all of these things are just the, the great, you know, they just bring everybody together. Right. And that's been, that's been the biggest thrill and blessing of everything I've been able to do in my career, you know, up until this point, which again, just repeats itself for good. So we, we only have a couple of minutes. So one last question, yep. favorite album of 2020. Favorite album. Oh my God. That's such a hard one. My God. Between. Uh, or favorite favorite show you went to. I mean, I'm, I'm for, <laughs> show in 2020. <laughs> but just a, 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 a highlight. Like, a, a, it could be a musical highlight um, because we've and, had so and, few and highlights. And, yeah, Anderson yeah. Pack shows are always a highlight. I'm going to space and say, I don't even know if it was 2020, but it probably was when we went out to a show in an outdoor field in, in Portland when Anderson played and that was just yeah. like, you know, we've probably seen a dozen shows with them. Phenomenal, ridiculous. 
I, I'm I'm with Dahlia on her on her comment, which is Salt's album. That's my favorite album of two thousand. Oh yeah, sorry, yeah. totally spaced. I'm gonna I'm gonna say the five the five and salt Barry Cole as Barry, Barry yeah. Cole as well. So, yeah. yeah, I think unanimously Salt. Brilliant. I'm gonna say within okay. within my notes, Salt, Salt, Salt. Every Salt album is up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Brilliant. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. I, I apologize about the, uh, the early technical difficulties. Thank you everyone who's joined us. Um, I'm going to be doing these every week. And, and just so you know, it's going to be about sort of like, you know, taking different people who have had some sort of a connection with, with Giant Step over the last 30 years. So it's not just going to be from the early days. It's going to be throughout. And next week, I'm really happy to have uh, Pablo Henderson, uh, who is uh, the person I developed W Records with, who has a really interesting background. Uh, his father uh, was the founder of the Notting Hill Carnival. Uh, so his sort of perspective on music and culture and also wellness and hospitality, I think is going to be very interesting. And as always, keep following us on um, Instagram at Giant Step. And please go and visit the website, uh, giantstep.net, and check out The Vault. And if you have anything that you think is going to be interesting to us, any memories, please send it to us because there's lots of holes in that vault. And I know you guys have things that we don't have and we'd love to add to it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jonathan, so much. It's always great to see you. Thank you, Morris. Um, Thanks for inviting me. Pleasure, it. pleasure, pleasure. You are going to be the first one always because without this, it wouldn't be a, without you, it wouldn't have been possible. So we had to have you as the first one. And love to everybody. Thank you all for joining. And everyone stay safe. Thank Likewise. you. Thanks for the bye support, bye. everybody. Bye. Congratulations, Morris. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.